Well, thanks very much. Very good to be here. Um, I had a really busy week last week in Johannesburg. I uh, spoke at the Free Market Foundation, uh, which Temba Nolichungu is the director. So thanks for hosting me, even though you weren't there to receive me in Joburg, Temba. Um, and I'm repeating that talk, but I'm going to change a few things and I, I'm going to make it a little bit more concise, a little bit more to the point, and hopefully open up some time for questions. Um, the talk is, is ostensibly aimed uh, at South Africa as a topic, but um, it, has, it has global application. And so I want to make sure that I refer to that global application throughout the, throughout the discussion because um, that's, that's important. And it also lets us know that um, we're not just picking on, on South Africa and on, um, on our own idiosyncratic problems, um, but we're actually part of a broader uh, global milieu and malaise uh, at the moment um, as the world slides ever towards uh, kind of collectivist leftist ideals and this battle of ideas I think is uh, more important and more critical arguably than ever and certainly as important as, as it's ever been um, and so I want to uh, go through the state of our economy but some of the underpinning uh, political ideologies that, that, that are prevalent right now in South Africa. Uh, talk a little bit about what the downgrade, the ratings downgrade uh, means for South Africa and, uh, and then you know, I, I've mashed up Venezuela and Zimbabwe because of course front and center in people's minds is could, we, could South Africa become a similarly failed state um, beset by mass shortages, hyperinflation and so on. So we'll talk about Venice and Zimbabwe at the end. Um, my overall message is to say that the ideological and uh, a better term really to, 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 to refer to that is the intellectual battle. The intellectual battle is well and truly on and it's uh, very much all hands on deck. I think there are, there are fatalists who say that South Africa as a country is doomed. Um, I don't think that's true. Uh, equally there's people who engage in magical thinking who, who, who suggest that perhaps somehow by some stroke of luck the country will be a successful country. The, the reality is that it's made uh, by people who engage in the battle of ideas, who engage in uh, these um, not only intellectual battles <coughs> but who get up every day and produce something constructive and valuable uh, in society. Um, and so to, to in a way echo some of what Temba spoke about in the previous talk, um, it's very much uh, something that has to be that can be decided upon it's not inevitable uh, but it can be decided upon and direction can certainly change but we have to identify the problem we have to identify the genesis of of some of uh, South Africa's major problems and so I want to start off by actually talking a little bit about uh, the philosophy and the underpinning uh, uh, philosophies of, of what we see in South Africa today you know, it's become incredibly difficult, surprisingly difficult, to convince certain people that we live um, in a socialist, an effective socialist system in South Africa. And one of the reasons why that's difficult is because words like that, words like socialism, conjure up things that we are very unfamiliar with, things that, that seem a million miles away. They conjure up, you know, Russian gulags and, and, and you know, farming collectives in, 19, in the 1920s and so on. Um, we've got to recognize that we're living in a time of what I call technocratic socialism. Uh, like any, uh, any idea and any ideology that gets refined by experience, it improves over time. Um, and we've seen this with, with uh, Marxist ideology. Now, we also shouldn't get too hung up on labels, right? But, but it's important to, to identify some of the genesis of these ideas. But whether you want to call it, you know, Marxism, socialism, collectivism, progressivism, these are all terms that have come to mean very similar things, right? Which is essentially, and I, and I, and I again use a, some, some of the terminology that Temba used, it essentially negates and deny the individual's <laughs> sovereignty and individual liberty. Um, technocratic socialism is the modern form of socialism. You know, when the Berlin Wall came down, uh, the ideas didn't die. The, their mode and their strategy and, and the means by which these ideas uh, are sold and are propagated changed. 
Um, and I think that that's very important. And it's very similar if you, you know, if you talk about ideologies very often being irrational, not evidence-based. Um, you know, you, you, you can liken certain ideologies to, to the way certain people, um, you know, uh, view religions and, and, and act uh, in uh, when, they, when, when their religious beliefs are, um, are questioned or are contradicted or when certain beliefs that people just hold very strongly are, are disproved by evidence. Um, they, they, they can very often hunker down, uh, bob and weave, change the way they formulate uh, their ideas and pivot essentially in very clever ways and that's one of the, uh, that's one of the, the things that humans do very well. We, we, we pivot very cleverly when uh, our, our beliefs, our core beliefs are, are, are threatened. And I think you've seen a very, very clever pivot by the left and by the Marxists over the last few decades. And so I talk about technocratic socialism, which is a much cleverer and much more insidious form of socialism. And it's underpinned by uh, what I call something, uh, what I call Marxism 2.0. Okay. So it's a revised and updated version of, of the old thing. And this is why people think that you're being crazy and ridiculous when you say that we live under, under a Marxist ANC government right now because they say, well, that doesn't seem right. There's uh, relative freedom. You can go out and buy things across the road. You own your house. Uh, we don't live in any kind of, uh, you know, m you know, major, uh, uh, you know, kind of totalitarian system on the surface. <clears throat> and they're right. Okay, I think I think you know we we, we cannot uh, we we cannot deny that we live in a much freer system. But this is what's so clever about this new form of insidious Marxism, right? And I think. To, to, to give a little bit of background as to where it's come from, what happened by the 1950s and 60s was that Stalin's Russia, Stalin's Soviet Union had been so resoundingly discredited, um, the, the mass deaths uh, had started to, you know, the news of the mass deaths and the hardship had started to filter through into the, into the West. By the 50s and 60s, you already started to have tremendous amount of defections uh, from Russia to the West um, and at the same time your much freer systems in Europe, Western Europe and, and, and the United States and elsewhere, um, even South Africa to, some, to a large degree, had shown that they were systems uh, that were conducive to upward mobility, that they were actually places that people were happy, wanted to live, where wealth was created, where wealth was actually created fairly evenly and it was actually the communist societies that were grossly unequal certainly politically, but even, e even economically. I mean, I argue that if the Gini coefficient were ever properly measured, it would rise to nearly one in, in socialist and totalitarian uh, you know, communist systems because very few people end up actually controlling income and wealth. Um, and so this, this, uh, this discrediting was profound, and what you had was a big pivot um, at, you know, among the intellectuals, uh, the, the, the postmodern intellectuals, um, and, and there was a pivot away from this uh, adversarial relationship that Marx had posited because it had proven to be uh, a, an adversarial relationship that could be surmounted and could be broken down. And that was the relationship between the worker and, and, the, and the employer, the, the proletarian and the bourgeois, the, the, the um, uh, working class and the wealth class. Because what people had experienced through the first part of the, of the 20th century was tremendous upward mobility in your free systems. And so I think what the postmodernists did was a very, very clever sleight of hand. And what, one of the things they did was they started to posit adversarial relationships that could not be surmounted. So if I'm a worker, I can uh, work hard, save money, invest, upskill myself, and one day I can be a, a, a capitalist and, a, and, a, and an owner of so to speak, the means of production. Um, uh, but, but if I'm positing that the adversarial, the fundamental adversarial relationships in society are black-white or male-female, these are things that now cannot easily be surmounted uh, uh, at all, right? They're impossible to surmount. And so you create much more sticky, it's a much cleverer way to, to posit the Marxist uh, uh, adversarial uh, uh, theory uh, 
by creating uh, adversaries between people and those uh, adversarial relationships cannot be surmounted. So that was a very, very clever pivot and that's what you see a whole lot of today uh, on, on campuses and universities. The new quite radical left is very much around these sorts of adversarial relationships and uh, very much underpinned by this postmodern Marxist pivot. But arguably even, even the, the even greater pivot in Marxism and what I call technocratic socialism was that um, Marxists realized the absurdity of physically seizing the means of production, okay, where you actually go in and seize factories and seize modes and means of production because that then creates for you the biggest nightmare and the biggest headache that you could ever possibly have. Actually running an operation centrally directed, trying to actually make products and widgets and various services and things uh, for people and trying to do it without making huge losses and trying to do it at a quality that people actually you know, desire at some level. Far easier to outsource that problem to actual entrepreneurs and then you regulate them. Because what is ownership? Ultimately ownership is control. Ownership without effective control is not real ownership, right? And ownership therefore is more than a title deed. And that's what the modern socialists have of course grasped and realized. That if they can have effective control, then they own. Then, so you get an ownership of the means of production through regulation, <coughs> through uh, edicts and, uh, and various laws and, and licenses and all sorts of things that force entrepreneurs to behave in ways that essentially diminishes and, and almost strips the ownership of the asset from them. But they're still tasked with running it profitably, trying to sell products into a marketplace um, and so on. And, and we, we, we have that in South Africa, but it's a, it's a creeping problem across uh, basically the whole world. Um, and a very good example of technocratic socialism right now in South Africa is the latest uh, tabling of the mining charter. Um, you only have to read uh, a, a few passages from the mining charter and you are reading socialism on a page. Um, the, the incredibly intricate and draconian rules and regulations that are required. I would shudder to, to think what the life of a, compli of a, um, no, a compliance officer but, but a procurement officer must be like. Because if you're a mining procurement officer you have to, you have to buy you know, something like 65% of your mining related goods from South African manufacturing companies and then South African manufacturing companies have a definition that says that you know 58 percent of their value added must be made from you know South African goods it's, it's, a, it's a hugely uh, convoluted web of things and then, and then uh, it goes much deeper than that so then of that you know 60 or 70 percent that you have to buy from South African manufacturers 25 percent of them need to be BEE compliant up to a level that is you know, X percent women and X percent youth and, and so on. And then these things, of course, are shifting the whole time, right? Because the, the person that you're buying from uh, may be changed from a, you know, 50 percent BEE-owned company to a 45 percent BEE-owned company. So that shifts your targets. So my, 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 uh, my bet is that many of these procurement officers just disobey these regulations and hope that they, you know, can pay some government minister off to, to get off their backs. But here's what happens, right, is that Mining Charter 3 gets proposed and it's absolutely draconian and uh, unworkable. <clears throat> the problem is that Mining Charter 2 is already in place and it's already draconian and unworkable. And then what happens is that everyone freaks out on this side and they say, no, no, we can't possibly have Mining Charter 3. And they get negotiated back to Mining Charter 2.5 or 2.3. And you've moved in the wrong direction again. And, and so these socialists continue to creep forward with these ever-marching uh, regulations. So, so this is a very, um, very dangerous and insidious form of, of socialism. And it's what we have in this country today. And it's incredibly, it's interesting how difficult it is to convince certain people that we're in this state of affairs. And I think one of the reasons why people struggle with it is because people really wanted to believe in the good story of the new South Africa. 
because there was so much to be, to, to be happy about and excited about and to believe in. But with this very, very strong leftward Marxist pivot that the ANC has taken, I would say, over the last really 15 years, many would argue that they had never abandoned their Marxism. At the very least, we had a period of, of time in the late 90s that was relatively uh, liberal and laissez-faire in a way, and in part, and that started to change then as we moved through the 2000s. And now we're very much mired in this. And I would then just say that this is now something that we're actually observing globally. We're observing it in, in, in Europe, we're observing it in America, in the UK, Australia, even and, and, and to some degree in China as well. <coughs> um, so that is the underpinning for, for where we've come. Now the ANC is a broad tent of ideas, right? Um, I wouldn't suggest for a minute that <coughs> you know, the entire organization is absolutely on the same page. Uh, when it comes to this stuff. And there are people agitating for reform within the ANC. It is a broad tent. <clears throat> but the overwhelming preponderance of evidence suggests that whether you're talking about, even when you talk about different factions within the, co the, the co current governing party, there's, there's a fairly strong degree of agreement on the ideological direction that the country's taking. Now you can call it the developmental state, you can call it Marxism 2.0, uh, you can label it various different things, but it's, it's at core um, a negation of individual sovereignty, it's a collectivism, and it's a belief ultimately in statism. That, that, that the state is the final and primary arbiter of economic activity uh, and of progress. So, what is, you know, what, one of the uh, some evidence of this is, is the ANC had a policy conference a few weeks ago. It was a one-week policy conference and uh, out of that policy conference came how many pages of, uh, of policy and ideology from that conference. One week, the ANC have these things fairly regularly, 220 pages uh, around strategy and tactics, around communication tactics and so on. And as you read through this, now I haven't read all 220 pages, but I've read about 30 or 40 of them. And as you go through this, what you, what you begin to see is a picture of a political entity that believes itself to be the final moral authority within the country, the arbiters of what's right and wrong, the arbiters of development, um, and, and, the f and they believe that they are in control essentially of the nation and its future. There's no sense whatsoever that, uh, that they should be part of creating an, an enabling environment for, for individual human beings to pursue their interests. Um, there's, there's one overarching globular uh, view of where South Africa is to be headed. And I just pulled out some, some quite chilling quotes from their strategy and tactics document, um, which is, yeah, absolutely Marxian, Marxist analysis to the core, um, but really totalitarian in, in, its, in its underlying political philosophy. So one of the things they said was, in this regard, South Africa's efforts at fundamental change represent a social experiment which resonates with humanity's progressive endeavors. Okay. So we've got all the right little key words there of what, what's really going on. And we know that social experiments uh, don't tend to end too well, do they? <coughs> um, at one point, and I quote, uh, they, they say that South Africa is a giant social laboratory, the success or failure uh, of whose undertakings has global implications. Okay, so, so the ANC is not uh, playing lightly here. This is very, very, very totalitarian. Um, and, and it's about... And, and they see the country, this, this governing entity that is essentially a party state. I mean, the ANC as a party and the ANC as a state, they don't see those as different things, right? This is, this is a party state, very much like you had in, in, in Soviet Russia, very much like you've got in China as well. Um, China's a complex beast. There is radical free markets and there is radical statism kind of coexisting in many ways. Um, 
uh, they go on to say that the ANC's ultimate objectives go much further, informed by the strategic posture to build a new civilization. Okay, so this is the kind of talk that is coming out of, out of the, the intellectuals in the party. Now again, I don't, I don't necessarily think that, that every, everyone in the ANC is on the same page and is lined up, but there's a group of, there's an intellectual Marxist cabal that sits behind here and underpins what we see coming out of these conferences. <coughs> and of course, you've seen it uh, with the likes of the Trade and Industry Minister, Rob Davies, who loves to, to say that 2008 and 9, the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, was the failure of capitalism. Loves it. Um, of course, you know, the fact that it was caused uh, by uh, certain government regulations, by central banks run amok, um, so somehow central banks have, have come to be regarded as capitalist institutions. <laughs> but, um, but central banks are monetary central planning politburos, right? I mean, that's, that, that is what they are. And, and, and we have the nationalization of money. So is it any wonder that the finance world is in turmoil? So, um, but what's interesting, and you know, Robert Higgs wrote this great and famous book in the late 80s called Crisis and Leviathan. And his essential thesis is a pretty simple one, which is that governments use crises, use fear, use the, their... their uh, purported ability to protect people and to fix problems, they use these crises to grow. And so uh, governments love war. I mean, governments love being attacked by another country, right? Because you can, you can create martial law, you can conscript troops, you can uh, divert taxes in, very, you know, in, in you know, very profound ways, you can increase taxation, you can get all hands on deck to fight the war effort. And after the war, do you think government shrinks? It usually shrinks a little bit, but definitely not back to the, the size it was before the war. After, th after the financial crisis, or during the financial crisis, Rahm Emanuel, who was President Obama's, one of his uh, chiefs of staff, uh, said, you know, uh, you should never waste a good crisis. He, he actually literally said that uh, uh, publicly, never waste a good crisis. Um, and what have we got now in the U.S.? A much larger state. Uh, we've got a much larger surveillance state, a much larger budget, huge borrowing, huge money printing. And South Africa very much followed the same path. In 2008-9, Pravin Gordon took the baton over from Trevor Manuel. Uh, Trevor Manuel had already started to ramp up deficit spending. Pravin Gordon then uh, continued with that, with that strategy. And since 2009, uh, South Africa's increased the national debt by about 1.8 trillion rand. From, so, so national debt was about 500 billion rand. We're sitting now at about 2.3 trillion rand of national debt with very, very little to show for it, if anything. Um, but the size of the state has increased, borrowing has increased, and we've seen this web of regulation continue to pour out into into areas uh, in the economy. So what I want to move on to next is to say, how are we doing? How's this working out for us? Rob Davies likes to say that uh, we've had very slow growth because of the financial crisis. Um, and then when you tell him that, uh, that other emerging markets have actually done better than us since the financial crisis, he says, oh, well, actually, the, the, the other reason is that commodity prices have fallen. And then you're able to show that actually uh, emerging markets that also produce commodities have outperformed South Africa and uh, they start running out of excuses. So this is our economy. Uh, this is a little difficult for you guys to see, but hopefully you can just uh, uh, grasp what I'm showing here. But basically what we're looking at here <coughs> is, our, is South Africa's real GDP, just shown in absolute levels on a, on a, on a chart. <laughs> the scale is a log scale, so every time you you cross a number on the scale, our GDP is doubling in real terms. Okay, this is an inflation adjusted chart. So what you can see very simply here is how uh, strongly South Africa grew through the 60s. Okay, the 1960s were, we had a very small government. It was a very stable Bretton Woods uh, kind of global exchange rate agreement. It wasn't perfect, but it was, in a, it was a sort of loose gold standard. Um, real GDP doubled in about 10 to 15 years over that period. And then we came into the stagflationary 70s and then the uh, 
the, 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 the very um, politically unstable 80s in South Africa as the apartheid system basically started to crumble in on itself, being a socialist system you would expect it to have happened uh, sooner or later. Uh, and so GDP essentially started to stagnate and we had basic stagnation in the economy through the late 80s and into the early 90s. And then we had a successful uh, 1994 political transition, relatively peaceful. Uh, it, it had global support and we had this tremendous growth period again that was then underpinned by the commodity price cycle rising. And now what we've had again is we can start to see that this is starting to taper off again. We've had stagnation for the last three or four years, very, very low growth for the last eight years. <coughs> and we're moving into this phase again of GDP stagnation. Now, what I want to show you about this chart, so that's kind of SA GDP SA economic growth over the last 50, 60 years. What's interesting about this chart is that when, when, we're, when we slowed down, the rest of the world kept going. And so this is us compared to global GDP, um, denominated to a level of 100 in 1970. Uh, global GDP has kept growing. So we fell behind in the 80s and you never catch it up unless you do exceptional and extraordinary things, unless you radically um, deregulate and free up your economy, you don't actually catch up that lost prosperity. And you can see again, once again, that's starting to happen as we slow down and the rest of the world continues to grow. This is a chart of our, of, uh, our emerging market peer, peer group, the median <coughs> of our emerging market peers who I've chosen as Brazil, Chile, Colombia, India, Mexico, Thailand, and Turkey, a very broad geographic spread of, of countries. Some of them are commodity producers, some of them are not commodity producers. Um, you know, and, and they have a greater or lesser degree of, of economic development. India is quite poor, Chile is, is more middle income, it's a richer country. Um, their dollar denominated real disposable income per capita has risen by about 50% since 2007. So I'm taking this from 2007, which was just pre that crisis, that, that, that uh, recession that we had. So why I'm doing that is to assess how did South Africa do comparatively through that recession period, and then how have we done in the recovery period uh, since then. In other words, your average uh, person in one of these emerging, your median, median person in one of these emerging market uh, countries, peer groups, is about... 50% better off in, <coughs> in dollar terms. Their global purchasing power has increased tremendously over the last 10 years. Now you can see how that's started to, to come off a bit and reduce because it probably rose too quickly and there's probably some bubble elements in that. Well, let's compare. Where, does, where do you think South Africa compares to our peer group? This is the, this is the Rob Davies argument that we've, just, we've, been, we've been given bad luck in this global environment. Well, that's where we are. Okay, so we're about 15% down. So, our, so, so, so we dollar denominate things to get a perspective on global purchasing power. You could euro denominate it, I suppose. You could perhaps gold denominate it. Anything that gives you a global numeraire. And we're about 15% <coughs> down in, in dollar global purchasing power per capita uh, since 2007. A dramatic underperformance. And I think this is just a, a huge indictment on the policy direction and the underpinning ideology of the ANC, which is essentially to say that we must redistribute wealth before we create wealth, <laughs> that, uh, that, that we must uh, operate as a giant social laboratory um, and create this new civilization. Um, when all we really want is someone to keep us safe and maybe fix a few potholes, you know. <laughs> because that's all a free people really need, right? Is just to be left alone, to be safe, to be kept safe by their government, to be, to be judged justly uh, before various courts of law. And uh, they'll do the rest themselves, as, we, as we're seeing in some of these other, other emerging markets, who are not perfect economies, who have, you know, some nefarious governments of their own, who have all sorts of their own problems, who have been exposed to commodity cycles, uh, downturns and so on, and yet <coughs> we continue to see tre tremendous progress in some of these offshore economies. 
So I think this is a very important um, issue. And, and the one thing you're starting to see now is the socialists now are playing a blame game. So what you get is uh, Pravin Gordon, Rob Davies, uh, uh, BC Jonas. Uh, there's, a few, there's a few people on, uh, who are the pure good Marxists, the intellectual Marxist cabal within South Africa. And they're distancing themselves from President Jacob Zuma and the, uh, the alleged widespread corruption of his administration. Um, and I believe that they're doing this because, they've, they're, because the numbers are in and they're seeing what an abject failure their policies have been. But let's not make any mistake that it's been the Marxists who've been in control for the last 10 years. We had Pravin Gordon as finance minister. We've, we've got Rob Davies as the minister of trade and industry. We've got Ibrahim Patel in the economic cluster. Uh, and various other key players have, have been running essentially the key commanding heights of the South African macro economy. And it's failing. And so now they're, now they're blaming it on Zuma corruption. And my argument really is that the corruption of the Zuma administration is really just the logical outworking of a Marxist underpinning ideology. I don't think you get Marxism without eventually getting corruption. Because of how it is set up and because of how essentially it creates the rule of man over the rule of law. How it enables key people to make very big and key decisions. And so it makes those governmental positions contestable because there's lucre and there's, and there's, and there's loot to be obtained from those positions. And that's inherent, I think, in the Marxist structure. Uh, Yuri Meltsev lived in Russia. I mean, Russia was probably one of the most corrupt systems that we've ever known, right? Um, it wasn't a squeaky clean system. And in a way, what you saw happen in Russia post-1990 and the way it transformed into a, into a better system, no question, but, a, but a, it transformed into this kind of oligarchical uh, state capitalist system because it was just a logical extension from some of the corruption that had been going on uh, in the Soviet Union. So. I'm interested in this political blame game that's taking place and how um, these Marxists are trying to paint themselves as the uh, uncorruptible saints and uh, distancing themselves from the Zuma administration. Whereas they were really uh, not only critical in getting Jacob Zuma elected, um, but have also benefited politically tremendously under his uh, administration. <coughs> so some people would say, well, okay, perhaps one of the reasons is that we weren't uh, fiscally loose enough, we didn't borrow enough money, uh, we needed to enact more fiscal stimulus, uh, then we would be like our emerging market peers. Well, that doesn't hold up because our debts increased more than pretty much all the other emerging market peers, with the exception of Chile. Now, Chile is uh, a much wealthier economy than us, but it started that financial crisis period at a debt to GDP rate of about 5%, which is astonishingly low. There's hardly any countries that have debt to GDP that low. And it's ramped it up tremendously. So their, their increase in debt is, is more than ours. But if you exclude Chile, we've ramped up our national government debt by close to 300% since 2007, way more than any of these other countries. Very little to show for it. I would argue the opposite is true, that the more you ramp up your government debt, the worse you're going to do. So that makes perfect sense with... Uh, with what we've seen over the last few years. We can also find some of the explanation in business regulation in South Africa. If you look at the Heritage Foundation's Freedom Index, uh, you could also look at uh, the Fraser Institute's Freedom Index. <coughs> Neither of these index indices are, are perfect. They have their measurement flaws. Um, but ultimately, they give you a pretty good general perspective of how economies are structured and whether, whether or not they're, they're free places to do business and to, to act as economic agents. And our business freedom score has plunged since the turn of the century. And uh, I, I'm sensing more and more that these, um, uh, these organizations that create these indices are getting a better handle on just the kinds of draconian regulations that South African businesses actually have to deal with. You know, we had um, even, even like putting, putting the, the ethics and the principle of BEE to one side, just the fact that those regulations have become more and more complex and onerous over the last 20 years in and of itself is a massive problem. Um, 
and, uh, and, and you're actually starting to see the very recent uh, few years of data from the Heritage Foundation and from the Fraser Institute, our business freedom, which is regulation, is starting to fall rapidly. Um, and, and this is now the, the sort of compounding effect of regulations that are emerging from different parts of society and different governmental departments and then they start to clash with each other and create uh, almost exponential increases in complexity in some of the, <coughs> the ways that business can operate. <coughs> so, no surprise that we are falling fastest when it comes to business regulation. And the other thing, of course, is that our government, the size of our government has grown dramatically. So what you're looking at there is the, the size, uh, the uh, government spending as a percentage of GDP. So in the 60s it was pretty low. <coughs> um, and it's risen up to nearly 30% of GDP. And uh, some of our emer emerging market peers, by comparison, are quite a lot lower. Most of them sit somewhere around the 20, low 20s level. Um, but the thing with a big government is that it gives you very little margin for error. Because what you do is you start centralizing resources. Um, and so if you make error with very heavily centralized resources, the errors are big and they have profound and rippling effects across the economy. Uh, so Nassim Taleb you know, famously talks about this concept of anti-fragility, right? which is when you actually grow from, from adversity. And one of the core characteristics of anti-fragility is dispersed nodes and, and dispersed centers of power so that if one fails, um, the others can respond. And the system can learn from that failure constructively and grow and patch it up and fix it. Whereas if you centralize too much, uh, you run the risk of total system failure. And that's really what we've seen in Venezuela and Zimbabwe and to a large extent what you saw in Soviet Russia was total system failure. Because you had simply centralized your error, uh, you, you, you had centralized um, your error exposure far too much. <coughs> So our government has grown fairly remorselessly and certainly over the last few years you know, is huge and when you consider that the bigger the government you get, the, the, more, the more you have to get things absolutely right for it to not be a huge drag on your economy, you realize that, that uh, inefficiency and corruption in government and so on is just uh, is taking place at, at such a large level of, of control in the economy that it just is, provides, a, it, it creates a huge handbrake on economic growth and on economic development. Um, so if you look at the Scandinavians, they run these big states, right? They tax probably 45, sometimes 50% of GDP. And as a result, for that to work at some level, they have to get everything else really right. They have to make sure that they've got free trade. They have to make sure that they've got minimal internal regulations and capital controls and so on. And so that's why your Scandinavian countries score in roughly the top 20, 25 freest economies on earth. Dragged down by their, their score for having a huge government. But everything else they get pretty much right. And they obviously have these extremely meritocratic uh, uh, public sectors. Uh, and uh, the other thing is, of course, that they are very high trust societies because they're you know, predominantly, you know, they're, they're pretty culturally, ethnically homogenous, and they're quite small countries. Very few people know that, that um, you know, Denmark is only a few million people, right? Introduce um, a multicultural society with huge income inequality, so you get a political cauldron <coughs> with, a, with a large state, with a non-meritocratic public sector. Um, you, it's just a recipe for huge inefficiency and huge state failure. So, you know, so, so, so the idea here really is that South Africa needs to drop significantly its size and also scope, the scope of government as well. So it's not just the size of GDP, but it's the scope. Martin van Staden uh, from the Rational Standard and the Free Market Foundation makes the good point that even if you're, you know, if, if you limit the scope of government properly to say defense, you know, police keeping you safe, and that happens to cost a lot of money, but you can spend it effectively and it does keep you safe, well then it's okay to have a biggish government if that's, if that's what it needs. I mean, in, in practice, to, for a government to keep you safe and do the basics, you probably need a 5% you know, of GDP government or a 10% of GDP government. These things can be achieved you know, with a very, very small state. 
in any case, this is part, I think, of the, the problem that South Africa faces relative to our emerging market peers. Okay, so let's talk about, let's quickly talk about life after the downgrade, and, and I won't spend too much time on this. The main thing to say is that when a ratings agency decides that you are no longer triple B, but in fact you are double B, or whatever the rating is, that's just a stamp. That's just a category. That doesn't actually impact real, real life that profoundly. So there's been a whole lot of sort of media hysteria around what a downgrade now means for us and will investors flee and so on. I mean, any investor worth their salt um, will make decisions far, far before the, down, the, the, the ratings agencies make their decisions. I always like to joke that if the ratings agencies were leading indicators, then they'd be investment banks. Okay, they wouldn't be, <laughs> they wouldn't be ratings agencies. The point of a ratings agency is to be a lagging indicator, to be quite conservative, to, 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 to make a decision about a country's credit rating quite late after a lot of evidence is in, and then it kind of gives it the rubber stamp. Um, so that's the first thing to say, is there's been a lot of hysteria around the actual act of downgrades. Of course, what is important is why we have been downgraded and why these rubber stampers have chosen to, to downgrade South Africa's credit rating. And I think we've been through a lot of the reasons why. We don't grow. We've mounted up huge national debts in a Marxist uh, regulatory web where growth and dynamism and wealth creation is severely constrained. And that's why we face uh, junk grade status at the moment as a country. As far as moving beyond that is concerned, most people uh, have said that interest rates will therefore need to go up because we're a worse quality borrower as, an, as, an, as a country. And that may be true over time, but we must also recognize that the short-term effects of that are actually the opposite. And we're starting to see that now. The Reserve Bank cut interest rates a few weeks ago. Inflation is falling. And the reason is because, again, <coughs> Ratings agencies are very much lagging indicators. A lot of your market moves happen before the ratings downgrade. The RAND weakened the most early 2016, a year before the downgrades. Um, interest rates spiked early 2016, a year and a bit before the downgrades. Um, and those market events set in process market forces that start to create healthy self-correction mechanisms. The market does actually work, even if it's given a little glimpse of space to work, the market does start to work. So the currency weakens, interest rates rise. What do banks do? They, they're much more cautious to lend money. Um, why would I lend money to Nicholas Wood Smith if I think that the interest rate is going to rise by 500 basis points over the next year or so and it's going to make his life very, very difficult and that means it's, he's a repayment risk to me as the bank so I'm going to be much more cautious. And so you've had a, a crimping in credit lending. Now the way the banking system works is that when banks lend money, they create money, okay? So therefore, money supply growth in South Africa is actually very slow, and that means that inflation is very slow, and so we're starting to see quite healthy corrections. As part of that, because we're not borrowing so much anymore, our trade deficit has disappeared. We're now running a trade surplus. That's very healthy. And so the currency has actually not been as weak as many people thought. So when the currency was weakening to 15 or 16 rand to the dollar, people were taking money offshore because it was panic stations. And you know, who can blame them because emotion does drive a lot of these decisions. But it was the worst time to take money offshore, at least in the short term. And we'll talk about alternative views to that in a bit. Um, and the rand is strengthened. So life after the downgrade doesn't have to be catastrophic, doesn't have to be bad, markets are starting to work. And that's, why we, that's how we then get onto the next phase and the final phase of this presentation because you know, if you continue to make prudent decisions at this juncture at, uh, on your key macro levers like your central bank, your money supply and your monetary policy and so on, you can get through this okay. But if you start to um, corrupt those institutions, if, you, if the states uh, starts to capture the central bank for nefarious ends, um, you then open up the door to a Venezuela or a Zimbabwe uh, type situation, which is essentially a failed state, highly corrupt situation that, that culminates in devastating hyperinflation. So we'll talk about that next. Let's talk about where South Africa sits on the Venezuela-Zimbabwe scorecard. Um, and I'm not going to sneak this up on you. I'm going to tell you right up front that the, the good news is that 
you know, we're still, we're still pretty far away from these very extreme, awful scenarios. But we're moving in the wrong direction, right? So you, you, you can look more like um, Venezuela or Hong Kong or Singapore, whatever, each day. If these are some degrees of extremes, they're imperfect in their own right in either way. But if those are your extremes, uh, you can look more like the one or like the other every day. And South Africa daily, slowly looks more and more like Venezuela, right? Um, so that's a problem. But we'll get into where we are because the one thing people don't quite appreciate with scenarios like Venezuela or Zimbabwe is just how bad they are and how, how, how corrupt and debauched the political system and, 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 and the whole social system has to actually become to get there. And, and so in many respects, we're in, we're in great shape here in SA. We're miles from that. And so we can be thankful for that. So what you're looking at here is Venezuela's uh, exchange rate to the dollar. Now, there are a few exchange rates in Venezuela, but the one I'm showing you here is the official exchange rate, which is pegged at uh, 10 Bolivar to the dollar. And then the free market exchange rate, otherwise known by some people as the black market exchange rate, let's, let's stick with free market exchange rate, um, is 8,820 as of a week or so ago when I gave my presentation at the Free Market Foundation. So this is what socialist governments do. They run parallel exchange rates so that the cronies can import things at 10 bolivar to the dollar very cheaply. And uh, the plebs have to import things at 8,800 bolivar to the dollar. This is the, this is the consequence of rampant money printing that has uh, essentially debauched the value of the currency. And so that exchange rate has de depreciated. And I've just turned the axis around. Um, to, to give you a sense of that, that fall in that currency. But here's the interesting thing, right? This is, this is a very current topic that you can follow because Venezuela right now is in the throes of incredible hyperinflation. I gave this talk at the Free Market Foundation about a week and a half ago on the 26th of July, and I made this slide on the 24th of July. So that's just a few days ago. Uh, and this is what has happened since then. It's gone to 18,900 Bolivar to the dollar. <laughs> so this is where we were at my free market foundation talk. Uh, 31st of July was Monday this week. Okay, so on Monday this week, um, it was 11,100, 11,000, call it 11,200 Bolivar to the dollar. And yesterday we got to 18,900 Bolivar to the dollar. So this currency is, as we speak, is in free fall as the Venezuelans lose confidence in their government, in the money, as the money uh, printing ramps up. And so it really is a repeat in so many respects of Zimbabwe's awful crisis um, that, we, that we write about in the book. So, um, so this is the kind of uh, absolute sort of debauchery and fallout that you get in these, in these awful scenarios. So, so it puts into context the rand going from 10 rand to 16 rand to the dollar and everyone losing their minds and, and fretting. I'm not, I'm not downplaying the, the, the problem of, of currency devaluation in, in, in the normal sense, like we've experienced it here, but this is the sort of extreme that you get to. And in a way, what you can say as well is that that gap between that 10 bolivar to the dollar official rate and the, and the free market rate <coughs> is really kind of like a corruption ratio in a way. Um, because the longer it stays, the more you know that there's this protected clique of, of political elites that are operating and forcing um, the rest of the country to, to, to accept this uh, free market rate while they uh, trade with exclusive privileges. So this is an interesting corruption, pre uh, corruption sort of index, if you like. And Zimbabwe had exactly the same thing, and then eventually the Mugabe regime would sort of devalue the official exchange rate. So in this instance, they might devalue it to 5,000 you know, bolivar to the dollar. And then, and then of course, uh, you, you get you know, continued de uh, depreciation of, of, of the currency. Um, so let's look at uh, the South African context. So this is a difficult slide for you to see, so don't worry about reading all the, all the, all the details. What I'm really showing you here is, is sort of political economy in two axes. And the one axis uh, going across is, um, is about having a state-led economy 
or a market-led economy. And the other axis is about, you know, do you have monetary corruption or do you have monetary stability? So the best place to be in this quadrant is up here on the, on the top right, okay, where you have monetary stability and you have a state-led economy. You've got market-led development, robust growth, social stability. Um, you've got, you know, vibrancy in, in civil society institutions. Um, you've got fairly stable, even growth, pretty strong growth as well, um, steady interest rates and so on, and a, and a strong currency and a stable currency. Um, and the absolute worst thing that you can be is bottom left, which is in a state-led system that's also got a corrupt monetary system. And this is where ultimately your Venezuelas and your Zimbabwe's and to a large extent, your, your, your Soviet Union ended up, I mean, most of your, your communist societies have endured some degree of hyperinflation um, at some point in the last hundred years. So the big ideological debate in South Africa right now, unfortunately, is not do we want this or this, or do we want this or this, but certainly the big debate within the ANC right now is are we going to have this or this? <laughs> so, so the, so the state-led portion is kind of non-negotiable. It's now, do we corrupt and capture the central bank, uh, which, is, which seems to be where a faction of the ANC wants to go, or, or do we maintain the integrity of some of these institutions, which I'll grant them, you know, the sort of Pravin Gordon faction wants to, wants to be. And so, really, it's a, it's a choice between what I call threat and, and fret, which is slow radical economic transformation or fast radical economic transformation. <laughs> And, um, and so I like to joke that it's a little bit, of, it's, it's a little bit like a choice between arsenic and, and, and cyanide, right? <laughs> so, so, so um, you know, we'll, take, we'll certainly all opt for, for arsenic if, if, if given the choice between arsenic or cyanide. Um, but this, unfortunate, this is the sort of Hobson's choice that we face in SA right now, and we need to somehow figure out how to shift the discussion, you know, across, across this way. Even light blue would be would be a whole lot better than, uh, th than any of the other choices. Um, now, where are we right now as a country? Well, we're pretty much mired over here, okay? Which is that we actually have had pretty stable monetary management. The, res the Reserve Bank of South Africa, to its credit, um, has, has managed things very, you know, pretty stably, has run monetary policy relatively well, and as a result, we've got very low money supply growth, very low inflation. Inflation's currently 4 or 5% in South Africa right now, arguably going to fall a little bit lower. Um, the problem is that we're in, so, so, the, so the good news is we're in the top left quadrant, the bad news is we're in the top left quadrant, right? Um, <laughs> um, so, so we've got this monetary stability, but we've got the state-led ideolo ideological uh, kind of development of, of this web of regulation, um, Marxian kind of uh, philosophy that's flooded into that whole policy space. And so what you get up in the top left is you get uh, stagnation. So you have low inflation but no growth. Social angst continues to bubble up to the surface because there's no growth, there's no jobs, there's no employment. And certain people start to agitate for fast radical economic transformation thinking that that's the way out. It's not the way out, of course. It, it, it plunges you deeper into a hole, particularly if you start printing money and, and, and uh, creating huge amounts of inflation. So that's the, that's the risk, right, is that, is that to, to accelerate things, we don't go that way, we go, we go this way. So that's where South Africa finds itself, and that's in many ways the, the sort of big political debate that's happening right now. If arsenic beats cyanide, then we're just stuck in arsenic for a while, for, for, for a, you know, a, a, a while longer. And we have to kind of, I guess, live with that and perhaps be grateful that, that we didn't get cyanide. So that's, at the moment, the, uh, the, the, the choice that we face. <coughs> um, and I would say that um, as long as we aren't plunging into this bottom quadrant, we're nowhere near that kind of Venezuela or Zimbabwe problem. But that, that's, that's how I would conceptualize the risk that we face um, as a sort of nation and as a political economy. Does that make sense? Okay, so the final thing I would show you, it's a little difficult to see, but this gives you some added perspective. So this is the growth rate of the money supply. There's a, a certain measurement of the money supply called M1. Uh, don't worry too much about that. But basically the quantity of money that's in existence in the economy. Um, and if you rebase our money supply to one, 
uh, in 2007. Um, it's, uh, so, so this is a log chart, right? So every time you cross over one of these, uh, one of these uh, points on the axis, in this chart, money supply is growing 10 times bigger, which is, which is immense, right? It's a huge rate of growth. It's, you know, 10 times bigger is about 1,000% or whatever it is, 900%. So, so South Africa has increased its money supply actually less than, you, than the United States, relatively speaking. Um, and, you know, both of whom have, have paled in comparison to Venezuela. So on the log chart, you can see Venezuela has increased its money supply by about 100 times since uh, 2007. That's, that's enormous. That's why you're seeing such r rampant hyperinflation emerging in Venezuela. So this gives you a perspective. So, you know, even when America and Ben Bernanke were printing these trillions, that's the perspective in, you know, in, in which they were doing it, right? Nothing like you see in these other, in these other uh, moments. And then what I've overlaid onto this chart is, is the, the same chart for Zimbabwe from 1998 to 2008 and Brazil from 1982 to 1992. Brazil actually <coughs> suffered a, a, a seriously uh, a big hyperinflation in the 80s and early 90s. But my point here is simply to say that it's these sorts of levels that you want to start watching out for when it comes to hyperinflation risk and the risk of a total economic collapse. And South Africa, thankfully, is nowhere near um, that, that degree of, of monetary uh, corruption. That's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is that you can see these things coming. They tend to, uh, to come fairly slowly and, and, and you can identify the problem quite early. So the good news, I think, in many respects, is that it's still all to play for. You know, Venezuela is at a place now where it's, where it's utterly hopeless. The only good news to look for now in Venezuela is when do you hit rock bottom so that you can start building something constructive in the future. South Africa is still all to play for. We're still, you know, we, there's still so much good about the way our macro economy has been managed. As much as I'm a critic of the South African Reserve Bank, I have to give them a lot of credit where it's due. Um, and yet there's so much um, underlying and underpinning uh, uh, Marxist ideology that, uh, that also creates you know, huge amounts of risk. So, so that's where we are as an economy. I'm not going to show you the last slide. I thank you very much for your time uh, and yeah, welcome to us in person. printed a lot of money, etc., etc. But the main reason, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, or I, I, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, but the, 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 the telling sign in both Venezuela and Zimbabwe was the uh, collapsing production of the economy. So if a collapsing production happens, that's actually when you get hyperinflation. Okay, so... So, um, so if the productive sector of the economy collapses, which is what happened in Zimbabwe, uh, so, so in Venezuela, the, the, that's actually the preemptive of high inflation, not money so, 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 so you're, I think you're, you're hitting on something important. Um, what I would say is that, is that you need both. So, so you, need, you need productive problems in the, in the political economy of a hyperinflation. It's the productive problems that start to emerge that force the politicians into, into tapping the central bank and the money pot that is the central bank, which you can print money out of thin air. Um, I would say, I, I forgot to mention this in the presentation, but I'd say two things quickly, is that hyperinflations basically happen uh, in two ways or start for two reasons. And, and sometimes you have either or, or sometimes you have both. And they are war or socialism, basically. And sometimes socialism is a lot worse than war. You know, you'd, you'd probably, <laughs> you, you'd, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, a, 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 you, you, yeah, so you can win a war, and, and, uh, and B, you know, you'd, you'd rather get bombed for a few days than have a decade and a half or two decades of, of, of socialism that just destroys the means of production. So, um, yeah, so, so those two things, and, and, and so either of those two things cause exactly what you're describing. So in, in the case of Weimar Germany, it was the legacy of World War I, the reparations, the, 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 you know, the hugely onerous um, uh, economic conditions that they faced and pff, printing. In Zimbabwe, 
uh, a catalyst was obviously the farm invasions and the, and the, and the huge dive in, in agricultural production. Um, but but it's, it's all part of the same sort of political economy problem, which is... It's very, very integrated, and, and so it's a complex um, political economy issue. So, so like, the wrong way to think about hyperinflation is an, a, a, a government minister wakes up one day and decides to print a whole lot of money, and then you have hyperinflation. Um, it's, it's a process of political decay. And really, in Zimbabwe, it started in the late 80s, really. Uh, and you could actually see that in the monetary uh, statistics in Zimbabwe. Money supply started to ramp up. Uh, a lot, uh, quite fast at that time. So what was going on? Well, the central bank was being, being sort of essentially forced to run very loose monetary policy. Banking system was not well managed. Um, so the institutional decay was quite, was quite big. You had increasing corruption in the Mugabe regime. The need to uh, help, you know, to, to keep war vet veterans funded and so on. And eventually that just started, that just kept spiraling out of control. So these things actually do take time. And in a way, you can see the genesis of a lot of that in South Africa, right? You can see the political antagonism, the frustration with, you know, the fact that so many people remain, remain poor. And so how do, we, how do we, you know, lift these people out of poverty? And um, so the politics is, is, is definitely festering in a way that, that can go in that direction. I mean, I don't think anyone would deny that. Um, and so that's why we've just got to, you know, it's all to play for. We've got to watch really closely. But the one thing I would say is that these things don't happen overnight. And that's for people who, who, who are trying to think about how to protect them, themselves, their finances, their families. Um, you have, you know, you have time to strategize. And, and if you're watching the right signs, you know, you can make, you can make good decisions. But it's a great point. And that, and that is that, and I think it's, the meta point here is important, which is basically that, um, Hyperinflation is essentially the end result of statism, you know, taken to its extreme. Political corruption taken to its extreme. Collectivism taken to its extreme ends up in hyperinflation. Pete. Well, just a short comment. You mentioned the, the, the state taking control of industry. So I was thinking, and, and sort of, um, it's easier for, the, for, for, for us or entrepreneurs, pseudo entrepreneurs, to manage enterprises. And the state, it's not the state's problem. Makes me, made me thought of charter schools. Interestingly, I know many libertarians sort of like charter schools, but, but it's something about the, the, the whole idea that you can just chart the industry in this. And yeah. the, the government can just play with the prices and the allocation and the nitty gritty. So the, the, it makes me, uh, it adds to my suspicion about the charter idea. Yes. And, and, it, and, and just to re emphasize, I mean, it's, it's a very, very clever form of socialism because you put the really hard problems of actually running an entity, making it profitable into, you know, and what's doubly ironic about it is that then you complain about how much all these CEOs are getting paid, but you're making their lives incredibly difficult and you're making these organizations very, very difficult to run and actually run profitably. Um, so, so it's, you know, if you can put that problem onto the private sector and then you can also blame the private, you can blame these guys for not hiring enough people and for doing X, Y, and Z with their profits. Um, but all the time you're basically, they're actually, you're just a, you're essentially the government operating as a parasite on these productive sectors and then just heavily regulating them, uh, using them as, you know, scapegoating them, um, you know, politically demonizing them and earning tremendous amounts of revenue from them. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very clever and insidious form of, of socialism. Uh, yes, at the back, Greg. So you were talking about, you mentioned Nicholas Taleb of Nassim Taleb, who's um, uh, in his commentary more on the, on the Middle East, but it's, uh, it's, um, it's probably a global thing. It's, uh, it's the, when the intellectual elites try to run things and it, it forms kind of a, a social experiment, obviously we get things blowing up, and it's the wisdom of the trader on the ground that tends to figure out how things work yeah. and to make people live together and to find some kind of peace and prosperity is like leave it to the traders and make people trade with each other. Yeah. For you as a man on the ground, of one of those people kind of from the bottom up perspective. If you had to try and project forward, you say now that you're optimistic about our, our or potentially optimistic about our outcomes, what couple of indicators would you say that if we passed that tipping point, you would no longer feel that way and you would think that we, we, we were, we, we've gone past the point where your optimism faded? So that's a, that's a great and tough question. Um, I mean, my first answer to that is a little bit of a cop-out in the sense that I'm not sure that 
that any trajectory that, that a country then embarks on is ever irredeemable. So there's a sort of, there's a view that says once you start printing money at beyond a certain rate, uh, you, you know, you can't avoid the ultimate collapse and hyperinflation. I mean, I'd actually disagree with that. There, there's, there's, you see in numerous countries, the empirical data is quite clear. Some go Zim style or, or you know, Hungary in the, in the mid, 19th, mid 20th century or Weimar Germany, the utter extreme of hyperinflation. And some do a kind of a Brazil or, a, or another kind of uh, example where you had very high inflation, it was, it was a terrible situation and you kind of reined it in and you, you started to reform and you actually you actually turn things around. So, so I like the question and I think about these things. I'm less, I, th I think my, my conclusion after thinking about it a lot is that, is that we've got to be careful to say, okay, here's a marker, here's a marker, here's a marker. And once those three have triggered, like I'm done, I'm out. I'm off to New Zealand, you know, um, as opposed to, you know, I think it's still qualitative. You've got to, you've got to really wrestle with some of the qualitative aspects of these things. However, to, to kind of answer your question a bit, I would say that, that capturing the central bank and, and, starting, and, and, and politicians starting to use the central bank for overtly political ends and basically for looting, you know, to, to literally and physically kind of extract money um, from the printing press. I mean, I think if we start to move in that direction, not just because they're printing money and therefore it's inflationary, but it's what, it, it's what that would say about our legal system, our institutions, you know, the ability of the central bank to remain relatively independent, and so on and so on and so on. And so I think this whole idea of state capture, as much as it's an overspoken about, arguably overspoken about problem, um, it is a big problem and it is key, you know, and, and we, know that, we know that the government is, is compromised um, certain aspects of the South African Revenue Service. Um, I'm all okay, by the way, with the less efficient revenue service, um, but, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's compromised the National Treasury. And, and now I call it Saab Wars, right? The, the Reserve Bank, the war over the Reserve Bank now. Saab Wars is, is well and truly on. It's out in the open. The public protector recently um, you know, made some comments about needing to change the constitution. The reality is you don't actually need to change the constitution to capture the central bank. The president, it's at the president's uh, uh, pleasure to, to appoint the central bank governor when his term ends. Um, so you can actually infiltrate the central bank with the right people, with the acolytes that you need. You can capture that central bank and then you, you, know, and then you can do a whole lot of bad with that. So um, it's not the only measure to use, but it would, be a, it would be something that could be monitored. It could be monitored in the press. You'd read about it. You'd, you'd, you know, you'd uh, come to Russell and Birdie presentations and hear about it. But the point is that um, it would be symptomatic of, of the decay that would be going on. So I think it's quite key. I think the central bank is quite key um, to, to look out for. And then there's a few political things that, I, that would be really big red flags for me. So the one thing is, the, is that the ANC is wanting to, uh, to reduce the number of provinces. And that's uh, a, an effort to centralize more power at the, at, at the national government level. Um, and so more national government level centralization would worry me. You know, I, I, I'm a great sort of power devolutionist. So the more, the more dispersed power that you can have, the more dispersed distributed actors that you can have that have power in the system, a bit of a Nassim Taleb kind of concept the better. Um, so, so the ANC are already pressing for that. That would be a, and if that gains more traction, I would, I would worry. And then the final thing I would worry about, and, and uh, Mr. Nolichungu spoke about uh, the 2019, he alluded to the 2019 elections. It's not obvious that um, the ANC, as it's currently constituted and, and, and the core power base of the ANC, it's not obvious to me that they lose an election and hand over power. Um, if they lose an election and, you know, hand over power, that would be a great step in the right direction. Um, and if they don't, it would obviously be a, a huge problem and a huge red flag. And it's, you know, I'm not convinced yet that, 
that the ANC thinks about democracy like everyone else thinks about democracy. Uh, democracy, dem democracy for us means, means you know, plurality, voting, if you lose, you lose, if you win, you win, and, 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 and we do it in a, in a system of checks and balances and so on. I mean, for the ANC, democracy is a euphemism for socialism. Um, the National Democratic Revolution is a Leninist kind of socialist plan, right? Um, and they talk about it all the time. This is core ANC policy. So, um, so and, and, and if you read ANC documents, uh, the party believes that it is the rightful custodian of the states of South Africa. That's how it, it, it does not have any place for opposition. Um, and so I would, I would see that 2019, to the extent that the ANC could legitimately lose the election, that in itself will be difficult because, um, you know, ANC plus EFF votes in a, in a coalition or in a re-amalgamated party, I think probably get the ANC over the line. But anyway, simply to say that um, I would look at uh, them not, not handing over power. Yes, there was there, yes, yeah, yeah, you were first, yeah. It's more of a comment as you were talking about um, technocratic socialism, mm -hmm. but then about the NHI that Minister um, of Health is talking about currently. And um, I mean, you have to listen to him for a few minutes to know that um, his whole presentation will be trashing of uh, private health care and um, trying uh, to tell us how bad it is. And just don't put that telling him about the man who was chased from a hospital or was not given a yeah. Don't ask him about that or uh, why 100 pa over 100 patients died um, in the healthcare system yes. that we currently in. So um, I find that the space that we are in South Africa is very it's exciting for me because I love news and our current affairs and all that. Uh, but, um, I mean, it needs someone to stand there. You need to be very observant and to tell that uh, socialism is keeping in. Yeah. You listen to politicians and how they speak. And, uh, yes. I mean, Jackson Tim just yesterday had a press conference and he was saying that um, if uh, a vote of no confidence against him would succeed, then that would take off ANC's power, which is total nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, they are spreading lies uh, to put fear in people. Yes. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. our in 2004 told people uh, when they were uh, campaigning for elections that uh, a vote for ANC, I mean for DA, would be uh, would mean that a of a And that's yeah. obviously nonsense. Yeah. But people yeah. don't realize that um, the current state of the ANC, um, they are, I think they do feel that they might lose power yeah. because last year's elections were very, um, they should them to the core, yeah. although obviously they will say that out loud. Uh, but, um, <coughs> sorry, who takes such events as uh, today's one uh, for people to always be alert? And um, I mean, if government wants to encroach on freedom, you need to stand up and identify, knowing and control my freedom that the Constitution says I do have. Um, so uh, on the 7th, people will be marching, uh, maybe some here will be too. But I, I think I'm too scared to go. I don't have to be cashed or <laughs> so I think it will be too late. So what I'm saying is it's important to actually look at what's happening currently and to take a moment yeah. and notice that um, socialism is creeping in. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, people do believe. Uh, on Monday, I had a conversation with the young people in the library. And uh, they believe that socialism is the answer. And I think it came just so I was there. They do believe that socialism is the answer. Yeah. And um, I was asking them, OK, so uh, if we share the world that we have now as a country, what happens after that? How do we make more money, for instance? So, um, quick comments on that is that the battle of ideas is is very important and it's and it's on and it's very critical. We have to be uh, woke. <laughs> 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 um, we have to be we have to be libertarian woke, right? Um, really, really um, alive to 
to what's going on. I think so many people have fallen asleep. I would just, my final comment would be what, to echo what Temba said, which is that if you engage people one-on-one -on -one and, you, and you take labels away. So we've been throwing labels around here today, Marxism, socialism, whatever. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but when you engage with people, if you just remove the label and you talk about, you know, what, you know do, you, do you think mutually beneficial exchange is a good thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, who could possibly disagree with that? Well, that's, what, that's all that free trade is, right? So, so if you engage with people, if you say, you know, do you want to be left alone to pursue your happiness, to, to pursue the things that, uh, that, that, that interest you, um, Temba's right that you ultimately get to an essential classic liberal and, and, and sort of you know, uh, libertarian position. Um, so the battle of ideas is very much on, and yes, we fight, we fight an uphill battle. I mean, there weren't 500 people trying to get in here today, right, to, to come and watch uh, <laughs> this presentation. So, so, um, so the point is that we, we're in the trenches, but it's all to play for, and the country is worth fighting for. Uh, that's that's a message I want to leave with everyone. I, I think that uh, with that, and, uh, Tim, you had a question, but it cannot be a one-on-one. Uh, yeah. yeah, in line with that, you mentioned they are on the society, an expression in common. Uh, regarding the NHI, uh, I can only just advise that I think some kind of script there will be on our website and possibly this might be, be republished in some of the newspapers. Critical vernacular, so common for the reason of the energy. Yeah, it is so politically incorrect that some people might resort to those who are for energy and might resort to ad hominem and critical criticism, which is what nobody happens when this kind of thing happens. Just on, on this point, you know, of uh, say that ANC not see democracy the way that people yeah. ask all of us to generally mm -hmm. understand it. Yeah, and that perhaps I might lend them to be disinclined to accept any negative outcome of the elections and so on. Uh, I'd like to think that with a powerful uh, NGO sector, civil society and organization in this country. International pressure as well. Yeah, and the international pressure. But especially, especially we have well organized, though diverse, mm -hmm. in terms of their agenda, civil society in this country. Mm -hmm. It would be a very, very difficult situation for the Well, in a way, um, it wouldn't be a marker of decline as much as it would be decline, right? So yeah. in the sense that if for the ANC to pull off that sort of uh, degree of authoritarianism and say, no, we're not accepting the election result and civil society will explode, then we will be in the throes of a dictatorship and it will be plain for all to see. Um, so yes, it's quite an extreme way to think about our future. But, um, you know, I'm yet to see good, I mean, the ANC have handed over power at local levels and at provincial levels, but it's a very different story handing over Pretoria. So that'll be an interesting uh, dynamic to watch for 2019. But thank you, everyone. Yeah.